This video is not about the childhood of Achilles. It's got nothing to do with Thetis dunking baby Achilles into the river Styx, nor about that time she nearly boiled him alive just to prove a point, nor how drunk baby Achilles vomited all over Phoenix at a party, or how he was left in the care of Old Handy, the centaur, as Mary Renault terms him. Many of those popular tales are perhaps later additions to Achilles' story, but this video is about the pre-literary, prehistoric origins of Greek mythology's greatest and perhaps most human hero. Welcome to Ancient Classics. When researching these videos, I try to read widely. Try at least to read all the main English language secondary sources and all the ancient ones too. But this video is based more or less exclusively on chapter 4 of M.L. West's The Making of the Iliad, which in turn draws upon a wealth of earlier German scholarship, which I've not read. You know the thing, when you read a short chapter and you just think, damn this is so cool, I just gotta share this. Well, yeah, that's how I feel. We encounter Achilles as a fully formed and complex character at the very start of the European literary tradition. Achilles is most certainly the protagonist, the central character of the Iliad. And even though Achilles is out of the action for much of the Iliad, everything else that goes on without him is defined by his absence. And yet, the Iliad is, of course, just about a few days in the ten-year Trojan War. And when you look at the war as a whole, Achilles just isn't that important. Recall the epic cycle which, yes, as a concept, is probably a later construction, but nonetheless one rooted around older traditions. Achilles is an essential force in the Iliad. He features, too, in the collection of tales which make up the Aetiopis. He defeats the Amazon Penthesilea and the mighty Ethiopian Memnon, but he dies pretty much immediately thereafter. It therefore goes without saying that Achilles isn't there at the sack of Troy, has nothing to do with the Trojan horse, unless Brad Pitt's playing him, nor therefore does he feature in the stories about the return of the heroes from Troy, except for a cameo, as a ghost, in the Odyssey. He's not only absent from the end of the war, he's also absent at the start. He has no role in the Chalcis belly. He is most clearly not amongst the suitors for Helen, nor is he part of the pact to avenge Menelaus, her cuckolded husband. And indeed, if one goes back to the Apple of Discord and all that, you know, well, that's traditionally set at the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, Achilles' parents, before Achilles was even born. Achilles' possible absence from the initiating events of the war also ties in with the story that the Achaean heroes had to fetch him from Skyros that time when he got dressed up as a girl so as to avoid the draft. True, many, perhaps most surviving accounts suggest that Achilles was there at the outset of the expedition against Troy, but those accounts often draw attention to the fact that Achilles was young, much younger it is implied, than the other heroes who led the expedition. The idea of Achilles as a latecomer, either in the story or in the tradition, can even be sensed in the order and structuring of the famous catalogue of ships in Book 2 of the Iliad. The Catalogue of Ships is a passage nearly 300 lines long, dominating the second book of the Iliad. It lists the main contingents of the Greek or Achaean forces at Troy, naming the leaders, where they came from, and often with a few colourful details thrown in, including the first historical references to mullets. It seems to be organised into some kind of geographical order. It starts in Boeotia, then follows clockwise to Phocis, Yver, Attica, then Argos backing up to Corinth, then back round the Peloponnese, to Sparta, round to Pylos, Arcadia, Elis, then hopping over to Odysseus's home, then to Aetolia, then jumps to Crete and goes island hopping, Rhodes, Kos, and here and there. Then suddenly the catalogue jumps again to the lands of Achilles and the Myrmidons and to some other more northerly locations, which are all rather vague. One might almost think that the catalogue in an earlier form never really got much further north than here, and that Achilles and the other random northerners got tacked on at the end. Indeed, none of the other main heroes from the Iliad come from so far north, and Achilles is not even directly and specifically linked to any of the major Mycenaean settlements. So, whilst it's impossible to conceive of the Iliad without Achilles, one can quite easily reconstruct a Trojan cycle without him. 
Now, wait, perhaps you'll say. The Iliad and the Cypria make several references to expeditions made by Achilles against various cities, all preceding the narrative of the Iliad. Indeed, if you've read Pat Barker's Silence of the Girls, you almost certainly remember those harrowing opening chapters where we encounter Achilles' brutal raid on Briseis, his home. You'll say, read that. Achilles isn't an afterthought. You might well acknowledge that that's just Barker's 21st century take, but we'll still say that it highlights something essential, something that's always been there, something too important to be dismissed as pure retconnery. You might even argue that it's Achilles' earlier raids, or rather their victims, specifically Briseis, that are the real initiating force of the Iliad. And you know, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. I wouldn't play down the importance and centrality to the European literary tradition of those transgressions by Achilles against all of those cities and their people. Not at all. But those cities weren't Troy. See this map. These are the places sacked by Achilles, or otherwise associated with his earlier years. Briseis came from here, and here's Troy. This place, Teuthrania in particular, it's far away from Troy. There's a story, preserved in summaries of the Cypria, that Achilles and some others turned up there, mistakenly thinking it was Troy. But it's so far away, how the hell could they have made that mistake? Unless... There was a story that Achilles quite intentionally attacked that place, but that later tradition, trying to accommodate it to the Trojan War stories, fudged or retconned to the story, presenting it as an initial attempt on Troy and unintentionally making Achilles look a bit dumb in the process. I don't know, it's almost as if Achilles came from another tradition, extraneous to the Trojan saga, but then, somewhere along the line, got transplanted into the story of Troy. One can even make guesses about the nature and origin of that tradition in which Achilles was originally cited. Geographically, these places are all located near-ish or in the vicinity of Lesbos. Lesbos was settled by people from Thessaly, perhaps in the late second millennium or early first millennium, so possibly Achilles is a hero from those people's traditions, the lesbians or Aeolians. Though Achilles is not cited as a founder of any particular city or colony, perhaps his raids around the area have their roots in a newly arrived people making up a hero, a forerunner, who'd been there before them. Well, that's the theory. Or shall I say, it's a theory. And yeah, there's no direct evidence because we're talking essentially about pre-literary archaeology. Take it or leave it, but whatever, worse, it's good fun to imagine how it might have been, and it gets us to ask questions about the what's and how's and why's of the texts that we do have. In The Making of the Iliad, West imagines this process going through several stages. First we have Achilles' initial association with the Trojan War, then there is a stage one, when Achilles, as an obvious newcomer to the war, is brought in to fight later than all the others. Perhaps this is the era of the story about the Greek heroes fetching Achilles dressed up as a girl to escape the draft comes from. Now, if Achilles is such an important hero, one so important that he has to be transplanted into the Trojan War, he needs to fight against one of the greatest, in fact the greatest of the Trojan champions, Hector. Perhaps Hector was invented for that very purpose. I mean, he doesn't really serve any other function in the Trojan stories after all. Or perhaps Hector was already known as the greatest Trojan hero, so the fan base just demanded that the two heroes from two different franchises just had to clash, a bit like Freddy versus Jason, or Predator versus Alien, Batman and Superman. In a second stage, Achilles is integrated into the story of Troy more closely. Now, even though he is not one of the original suitors of Helen, he is at least part of the original expeditionary force. But if Achilles is such a superhero and joins from the start of the war, then why didn't the Achaeans win immediately? Why didn't Hector and Achilles meet earlier on? A bit tricky, so a story has to evolve to address this inconvenience, that everyone is afraid of Achilles, no one comes out to fight. And then, the quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles is invented as an excuse to keep Achilles out of the fighting and allow the other heroes, like Diomedes, to shine. But then Achilles needs to be brought back into the war so he can have his face-off with Hector, hence the whole Patroclus episode. But with Hector, the greatest of the Trojans dead, Achilles is now predominant, but no one has yet managed to integrate Achilles into the end sequence, the sack of Troy, leaving aside Brad Pitt. 
So an additional plot element needs to be brought in to bring down the supposedly unstoppable hero before the sack. Yeah, the arrow in the heel, and then perhaps soon after that, the backstory about why only his heel is vulnerable. That's the third stage in the tradition and even beyond. West seems to be of the view that the shift from the first to the second stage took place only shortly before Homer took up their craft. As a further flight of fancy, one perhaps a little too specific, West posits that Homer might have been instrumental in the move from stage two to stage three, but then decided to exclude Achilles' final few battles and his death from the Iliad so as not to overshadow the scene between Achilles and Priam with which the Iliad ends. Personally, I think the four-stage process outlined by West is a little too specific in its details. In chapter 7 of The East Face of Helicon, a book written by West just a few years before the making of the Iliad, West makes a similar point but more indirectly, and it's more powerful and compelling for it in my view. It's worth quoting at length. Behind the Iliad stands a centuries-old tradition of Greek martial epic. The formulaic vocabulary for armour and weapons, for killing and wounding, for chariotry and massed fighting, for heroes who are the sackers of city or famed with a spear, and the notional poetic ideal of celebrating Clea and Drawn, the renowned deeds of men, suggests a conventional emphasis on battles and heroic accomplishments in the field. Seen against this presumed traditional background, the Iliad seems to represent a remarkable shift of focus. The conventional matter is there in abundance, and the poet shows that it is quite to his taste and that he knows perfectly well how to draw upon it and fill it with new life. But he uses it largely as the backdrop to a human drama in which actions are less important than the emotions they arouse, and the psychological case history of an individual, i.e. Achilles, occupies the foreground. And it's the integration and late-stage development of the newcomer Achilles into that wide-screen Trojan War setting that makes that shift possible. Well, that's one way of looking at Achilles' origins, how from a narrative or saga perspective he came into being. But what about his character and his personal qualities, which, as we've just noted, are so deep and profound? How did those form? If we're going to go with the theory that I just outlined, then presumably at least some aspects of Achilles' character had already formed before he became associated with the Trojan War. He needed to be such a compelling character in order to gain the popularity that justified his transference into another story cycle altogether. So what is it that makes the character of Achilles so compelling? What about some of the wider cultural influences that might have been channeled into the creation of the character? For sure, many of Achilles' characteristics are of an archetypical nature and can come from any number of sources or even from some kind of primeval cultural instinct. But many have seen distinct elements of the demi-divine Mesopotamian hero Gilgamesh in the character of Achilles. Again, I'm relying mostly on Martin West's account, this time from chapter 7 of The East Face of Helicon. Both Achilles and Gilgamesh have mortal fathers and divine mothers. Mothers who seek to guide and intervene in their sons' lives, only too conscious and distraught by their mortality. Sure, both are handsome, mighty warriors. Of course they are. They are epic heroes. But more significantly, both heroes' characters are defined by a conflicted emotional complexity. Their stories are defined by their intense relationships with a male friend whose death leaves each devastated, setting off a literal or figurative journey to extremes of killing, slaughter and death in Gilgamesh's case, to a mystic afterlife land. But both reach a profound sense of resolution or acceptance or I don't know what. How can one describe the state of mind reached by Achilles after his audience with Priam in Book 24 of the Iliad? These connections, arguably, are far too specific and deep to be just standard heroic tropes. As West puts it, we are dealing not with merely coincidental analogies, but with historical connections. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that Achilles is the Greek version of Gilgamesh, or even Gilgamesh transplanted into the Trojan War. He's no copy-paste. Not least because the other great Homeric protagonist, Odysseus, shares other somewhat different traits and experiences with Gilgamesh. We can only guess 
who might have been the original template for Achilles, but it seems not altogether improbable that his character grew through exposure to the Gilgamesh tradition. But when and how? It needn't have been through a single interaction. For me, this is just one albeit major manifestation of a wider cultural phenomenon. When and through what means cultural influences from Mesopotamia and from the other cultures from that era that we might loosely call the Middle East made their way into Greek literature and culture. It is one of the most vital and interesting themes in classical studies. The very idea fills me with a sense of awe and mystery. West's East Face of Helicon is an attempt to systematically catalogue the parallels between early Greek literature and the literature and culture of the Middle East. Walter Burke's orientalizing revolution tackled these issues, but with less of a focus on literature, about a decade or two before West's East Face of Helicon. I really love the closing paragraph. Culture is not a plant sprouting from its seed in isolation. It is a continuous process of learning guided by curiosity along with practical needs and interests. It grows especially through a willingness to learn from what is other, what is strange and foreign. The miracle of Greece is not merely the result of a unique talent. It owes its existence to the simple phenomenon that the Greeks are the most easterly of Westerners. Under the special circumstances of the 8th century, they could participate in every development at the time without falling victim to the concomitant military devastations, as did their neighbours in Syria and southern Anatolia. So, perhaps we can round up our little reverie, shall I say, on the origins of Achilles with this. Humour me. Let's just imagine. Suppose stories about the Trojan War had been circulating for generations, centuries perhaps, ever since a historical war in the mid-2nd millennium BCE, tales of which may or may not have become mythologised over time, becoming the tradition with which we are now familiar. The tale of the thousand ships, the wooden horse and all that. Meanwhile, a separate set of stories had arisen about the violent, emotionally conflicted raider Achilles. At some point, Owing perhaps to his popularity, Achilles was transplanted into the Trojan War, a tradition to which he had not previously belonged. Around the same time, if not before, we have another wave of cultural influences and exchanges between the lands occupied by the Greeks and the Near and Middle East, though it would of course be overly simplistic to presume that such exchanges had ever ceased entirely, directly or indirectly bringing modes of heroism, storytelling and character building which would coalesce around the character of Achilles. The insertion of a hero from one tradition, Achilles, into another traditional setting, the Trojan War, is a catalyst. It forces the poets to write a compelling, emotionally charged narrative around that hero against the Trojan War backdrop. Hence, as alluded to by this passage from which I quoted earlier, we have the unique drama a tragedy of Achilles standing out from the conventional martial epic backdrop. And it's that combination of traditional stock material and an emotional, dramatic, character-driven story that makes the Iliad the classic that it is and with which everyone else has been playing catch-up ever since. I feel on this channel recently I've been gazing into the unknown and unknowable a bit too much which is all very mystical and fun, but perhaps it's time to turn to more worldly themes. So next time, we'll dig back into finance and banking. Meantime, like and subscribe, and we'll be back soon.